when I thought of coming here, uh, you think of pigs. So I just thought the three little pigs and fairy tales. <laughs> and, uh, and to a degree, that's, that's what we're doing in life, is we, we do fairy tales. We, we think of life in terms of you know, the prince meeting the princess and living happily ever after. And that's, not all, that's, not, that's true in a way. There's some moral stories. But uh, things, things often change in the way. And like Shrek, there's no always uh, that, happy, uh, that happy answer. Just, just some comments that we were talking about. So, you know, I think neurocystic is a disease. And from my point of view, I, you know, it's a disease that I need to treat. And it's a, it's a bad disease. It's a bad disease because it has consequences to the, to the detriment of the patient in terms of health, in terms of costs. So I basically see two problems. Is that, is that when I see a patient, the patient, I can make the diagnosis. The patient is, has neurocystic psychosis. In which case, and then I have to treat the patient. And so that's, that's easy for me, but like I said, the patient still suffers because now he's got to take treatment, he's got to be on epilepsy treatment, or he's got to go through that stage where he was sick. Then I see another type of patient who we don't know what the disease is. Where, so not everybody knocks on your door and says, I have neurocystic psychosis. Sometimes they just come with a problem, like an arm not moving or seizures, and then there are many varied causes, so it's often a diagnostic dilemma as well. Then I, I've come to realize and that it seems that I live in this, in, in this fairy tale, I'm more like Rapunzel. I live in this, uh, in this ivory tower. So I don't see, I don't see uh, every single patient that I should be seeing. So, we, so obviously we're missing some patients. We, I see a predominantly urban drainage of patients. So when you guys are talking about 30% uh, of people uh, of neurocystic psychosis and epilepsy being related, that's, that's true and that's prevalent in the world, in, in endemic areas. But where, where, uh, in Pretoria, we, we might be seeing 1% or 2%. So for all I know, I could be living in Los Angeles and, uh, <laughs> without the movie stars. Then just a short point about how we're talking about this, about the prevalence and some of the issues that we see. So 30% epilepsy is the neurocystic psychosis manifests mainly with epilepsy. And if you look at it at a developing world or an endemic area, um, it's, a, it's, it's the biggest cause. Biggest cause and most, most easily reversible cause or preventable cause. But it's not, it's not as simple as that. We, we're thinking now of epilepsy as being a multifactorial problem. And, and if you think about it, not everybody who's got neurocystic has seizures. And that, that makes it more difficult. That means that some patients who present with seizures and you see something in the brain, it may not be as a result of that. And because we're talking about people who are um, who live, who have a lower socioeconomic area, because, because these are people who don't have access to water and who don't have, who have, as we were talking about, um, the environment is not perfect. And these people have other problems as well. So they can have, they can have uh, perinatal issues, so the, the mother may not have had uh, access to health, so they can be problems with the birth, they can have higher risk of alcoholism, they can have high risk of head injuries as well. So this thing compounds the fact, compounds this whole picture. It's not just you have a scan and there's a neurocystic psychosis, therefore it must be directly, it's always going to be epilepsy. So, and that's the issue that we have sometimes is in our literature, when we're treating people with neurocystic psychosis to try and prevent them from getting seizures, is that we're not succeeding all the time in preventing the seizures because there's so many other issues behind it. Partly it may also be because the uh, removing the cyst doesn't remove the focus of, of damage to the brain. So let's just start off by saying that it's not a new disease. It's been with us from the 17th century. Um, but what, what is changing is the, the dynamics of where it's, where it, where it's occurring, and, and, the, and we're understanding more about it. So what, we, what, we, what has changed now in the last five years, ten years, is that we have a better way of diagnosing it and a better way of treating it. But sometimes it's like a balloon, and the knowledge is the balloon inside, and the outer surface is, is what we don't know. So as we know more, we also don't know more. And then we'll highlight what we know and what we don't know as well. So we know that it's endemic in low-income countries, and South Africa was going to, and some areas of South Africa fall within this um, endemic area, and it's a very common cause of acquired epilepsy. So the, the average quoted values 
a lot of the studies are from uh, South America, um, uh, and they, 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 they say there seem to be a, a gender correlation all over the world with the prevalence and incidence. So there's an acquired, uh, it's a large cause of acquired epilepsy, and it's very important, or it's, it's, we, should, uh, we should mobilize against it because it's, it's, it's not just a, a disease we, where we can just talk about, but we can eradicate it if we um, pool our resources and knowledge together. So if we talk about where it is, the idea is just that um, the countries in the red are the countries where it's endemic. So if you think, so that's where you see it, but it's also pre prevalent in the countries in the blue, and then the, the group three countries where you think maybe I should run away there are countries where we don't have information about. So the more information, the, the better we can basically deal with the issues. So we, it was already covered earlier about the intermediate host and the human host. Um, and, and what's coming, coming across now is just that, so, so we know it's, fe it's feces contamination. Um, and it seems that epidemi epidemiologically, it's not just, it's, it's concentrated in a household as well. So if you're in the household, that, that's most likely, not, that there's a higher incidence of where the, of where the source of, of eggs is coming from. So that's number one, that's something new that came out. And that it's also, it also occurs in people with no history of pork consumption. So in New York, the acidic Jews have also had it. And then it's been related to um, household help. Uh, from, uh, that's where they get it. And uh, that's, that's point number one. And then just to come, come to the natural history of it. So we know that cysts in pigs are going to, um, it takes, are going to be there for about two to three months. But human beings, it's a bit more difficult. So, so the way we work out, if somebody had to ask me, when did I get infected? It seems that the infected period is, is anywhere from two years onwards. Um, and, and how they worked this out was that there was a, uh, British soldiers went to India. They went to India, and then when they returned, so you had a time when they were going to an endemic area, and when they returned, it was, you, you, you knew when they left, and you knew when they developed seizures. And on average, they developed seizures at about two to three years, and then they, they continued thereafter. So that's, that's what we think is, the, is the, from start to end. Uh, what also happened was there was the, the king of Burma gave uh, the people of Papua New Guinea, he gave them some pigs as a present. And he gave them, the, and these pigs were contaminated. And two, to three, and two to three years after he gave it to them, people started falling into fires and started burning them and burning themselves. And those were seizures as well. So that, that's where we think if you're if you exposed to it, after about two to three years, you start getting, uh, the cysts will start degenerating and you start developing epilepsy. Okay, so now, now we're going to talk about the stages of uh, neurocystic psychosis. So the, the paras parasite itself in the, in the larval stage has, has quite a good way of um, evading destruction for that two to three years. And it seems that they secrete a variety of substances to inhibit uh, cell-mediated and humoral immunity up to a point. So they, they, they manage to evade it for about two to three years, and then they start dying. And we think it's the dying process that causes inflammation, and that inflammation is what leads to the neurological uh, sequelae. So the cysts die, and then they, the, uh, as they die, there's an there's a immune response. And the Im it's, a, it's an inflammatory response associated with the seizures, and then the cystic lesions resolve, or they form a calcified granuloma. And it's, so it's... So, the treatment will have to vary according to which, which stage that the, uh, the cyst is present in the brain. So obviously if it's alive, we, we can kill it, but if it's dead, it doesn't help to give you uh, something to, to kill. You can't give something to, if it's dead already, but then you still have to treat the sequelae. Okay, so this is a rough, rough idea of what the, uh, of, of, the, of the progression. So the first stage is you have your larva stage, uh, where it's sitting and doing nothing. And this is what we see on the scan. We can see the scolex. Uh, so this is also important to tell you, to tell you that it, the imaging, <coughs> we are only as good as our imaging, so to speak. So if, we, if you had to do a CT scan, you sometimes can miss, miss things, uh, but an MRI can sometimes show you more, more lesions. 
So this is what it starts out with. And then sometimes you can, have, you can have one lesion, you can have more than one, and sometimes you can't see the scolex. And then from there, it moves on to a, a colloid granular stage. So now it's, the fibrosis is starting around, uh, is developing around, around the cyst. Okay, so you're starting to get some changes there. And now it's starting to die. And as it's dying, that's the edema that we see around the mass. Okay, so just, just so you know, so this is not to, this can be anything. This could be a tumor, for example. It could be a tumor that's degenerating and you're getting a, a, a fluid in the center. Uh, this could be a, a, another infective process, like a tuberculoma as well. So at this stage, this is as it's dying and releasing the inflammation. And this, so this is an MRI and this is a CT scan. Again, you're seeing the edema. Uh, so as it's dying, this is a patient who might present with seizures. And then it starts calcifying. So, and then, as it, and then just to show you that you can have different stages in the same patient. So here's some areas of calcification and here's some areas of cysts as well. Again, so, with, so when it comes to MRI machines, not all MRI machines are the same as well. You get kind of one, like a 1.5 Tesla and a 3 Tesla, just your definition gets better and better. And we think the better your definition, the, the more cysts you're most likely to see. It makes sense as well. Okay. So some more areas of edema. Okay. So how, so how does it present? So how does it present in humans? You can have neurocystis psychosis and extra neural. So in affecting the brain and its brain and the brain axis and outside the brain. When it's in the brain, it can be in the brain itself, that's parenchymal, or it can be involving the CSF, the fluid around it. That's more extra parenchymal forms. And that when it's outside the brain matter itself, that's the extra parenchymal form. Uh, we talk about it being in the ventricle, in the subarachnoid space, it can be in the eyes, or it can affect the spinal cord. The two biggest ways that these, that it presents, the, the biggest way is actually epilepsy. So it can, as you said, destruction it irritates the brain, you get a seizure. Or it can present with focal signs. So here you have, a, you, have a, you have something that's growing in your brain and pressing on your brain. So as it's pressing, it can damage your brain. Just growing bigger, pressing on parts that you need. So you can have weakness in an arm, they can have sensory loss, they can have balance problems. If it is growing in a specific place, it obstructs the flow of fluid and that's called hydrocephalus. Then it presents with a more of a diffuse picture. So aside from just local pressure, it now affects, it now affects the entire brain, the whole flow of the brain. And then you present with what, what we call a dementia. So the patient has cognitive impairment or just balance problems as well. So now we know that it, it varies according to where it is. It also varies according to the number of lesions you have, the stage of the lesion, and where it is within the nervous system. And there seems to be an interaction with the severity of, the, of, of how the host reacts. So one person might have three lesions and nothing goes wrong. Then another patient has one lesion and they suddenly get seizures, which, uh, epilepsy, which can be intractable as well. So bearing in mind that this thing is growing slowly, you can have a, you can have a subacute or chronic phase. But with this inflammation, blood vessels travel through, this, travel through, um, through the, the subarachnoid space. And if there's inflammation, you can block a blood vessel within a second. So you could have one patient who's got a gradual progression and, and another patient who has an acute onset of an illness. So suddenly, the arm doesn't work or the leg doesn't work. Okay, so we talked about the manifestations. So parenchymal is in the brain itself. And cephalitis is when you get inflammation around the entire brain and they present with a very, um, with a, with a more of an encephalopathy picture. So there's a very acute, they're fluctuating level of consciousness um, and they're very confused. Then the intraventricular form, that's the one that blocks, blocks the circulation. That's going to uh, raise the pressure. And the subarachnoid form is the one that's going to cause arachnoiditis. So besides the inflammation, you have uh, your cranial nerves move through your subarachnoid space. So these people can have cranial nerve palsies as well. These, these clinical presentations can, can also occur with uh, TB meningitis, for example. So TB meningitis can also occur in the CSF, can also be in the parenchyma, uh, and can also be in the ventricles, and can also be a mass. So it's not always diagnostic, and we, 
and then we'll talk about how, how reliable are our tests to make the diagnosis. But the clinical manifestation ex is varied um, and not specific for neurocystic psychosis. You get another form of cystic psychosis where it's large grape-like cysts form, and that's called racemic cystic psychosis, and it's not, it's not directly related to a growing uh, larva. It's an abnormal proliferation of, of cysts. Okay, then you can have involvement of the eyes, the subretinal space, uh, so they, they, they complain about visual problems, recurrent eye pain and diplopia. Uh, uh, the nice thing about, extra neural, about ocular cystic psychosis is you can see it with an ophthalmoscope. You can also have involvement of your heart, uh, cardiac cysts, and these are usually asymptomatic, but you can have arrhythmias and conduction abnormalities as well. And then we saw a slide earlier of somebody with subcutaneous and intramuscular cystic psychosis. What we tend to do with the subcutaneous and intramuscular is just to understand that although x-rays can help you, there was a study that showed that you, if you had 12, there was a study in Peru, we had 12 patients, and six of them you could see it on the, uh, on the CT, uh, on the x-ray, but if you did a CT scan, you'd see more as well. Okay, so these are the, so let's just, if we can work on some, guess some clinical presentations based, based on these signs. Uh, so this patient here, can be asymptomatic. In fact, if you, if you look at them all, you can have this kind, this clinical picture, and all these patients can be smiling and walking around without any without any symptoms as well. So that's important to bear in mind again, in terms of our, uh, in terms of how how much significance we must attach to the scan as well. So this patient will be asymptomatic. Here you're starting to see some uh, calcification around this thing uh, around the patient, and w what we feel now is that calcification. Even though this, it's dead, it's associated with uh, high incidence of epilepsy as well. This is, the, this is one of the commonest things that we do see, is this uh, uh, calcification. Uh, then this is the one, this is a cyst in the ventricle itself. And as you can understand, the ventricle um, is, a, is a place where fluid moves from one place to another. And you can block, you can block, block the ventricle, the ventricular flow. And that presents with hydrocephalus. That's the balance and cognitive problems. This is the patient with the racemic cyst. Um, so you can see quite large. This one is going to cause more pressure effects. Uh, this is what they call a starry night appearance, um, where, where you have multiple cysts. The danger here is that if you, if you, try, and, um, if you try and kill the parasite or give, the, give somebody um, cystidal drugs where they have such a large load, you, your inflammation will be 10 times worse than somebody where you only have one lesion, and then you become, it becomes more dangerous as well. Um, this is where you see the cyst in, in the uh, eye, and this is the, to show the calcification. Okay, so now we're coming to, so how do we make this diagnosis? So we talked about patients where we can, we talked about the, you can do neuroimaging. So obviously, you can, if you do neuroimaging, you have an option of a CT scan compared to your MRI. CT scan is cheaper, uh, and, but even then, it's not as accessible as it sounds. Um, MRI is much more expensive and inaccessible, and that's, and, that's, and that's the problem that we have currently. Most of our patients will, will undergo a CT scan. We, we don't automatically go onto an MRI. So this test, CT and MRI is good, but you can miss patients, and you can diagnose patients that don't necessarily have any clinical problems as well. Uh, what about the serological t analysis? So what is, where we've moved, we've moved from an ELISA test to an um, immunoelectrotransfer blood test, uh, which is supposed to be a more sensitive test. The problem, problem with, the, with the test is that it's not always positive. So you miss, you miss up to 30% of patients when they have a single lesion, and it stands to reason that if it's in the brain, uh, it, it doesn't, there's a blood-brain barrier, so you, do, you, won't see the, you won't see the antibodies or the antigens in the blood. We don't do antibody antigen tests in the CSF. Theoretically, you could do it, but we don't do it purely because there's a danger. If you're putting a needle into somebody who's got a mass, you, there's a danger of them herniating. So we have, so uh, the, two, the two tests complement each other, um, and you need to know the prevalence of the disease. So in some places, the prevalence can be up to 30 to 80 percent. 
Um, so before you can work out the diagnostic probability whether the patient has uresis and psychosis or not. Uh, just to make it more complicated, there are some people try to make it into absolute criteria, major criteria, minor criteria. Okay. So if, we, so if I see a patient who has a cyst or who has a diagnosis provisionally of neurosis and psychosis based on the scan, the clinical picture, and possible positive serology, um, you, we have to tailor, tailor the treatment according to the type and stage of neurosis and psychosis. So you've got an option of doing nothing. You've got an option of treating the patient and killing the... Um, the parasitic um, larva, and then you have an option of surgery, and those, that's that's where you're going to have to that's where you're going to have to decide, and then you have an option besides just treating the um, treating the, the cyst or the infection, you you can treat with anti-epileptic drugs and some dramatic treatment, which doesn't change the course of the disease, but improves the patient's complication rate. Okay. So what, so what has changed? What has changed? We, at one stage, people used to recommend praziquantel. We, we don't use it at all anymore. Uh, it has less, it's less efficacy than albendazole. Second thing is that when you give praziquantel together with steroids, your dose of praziquantel becomes lower. So, so that's, that's out currently. Albendazole was used for up to a month, okay? You'll see that there are some, there are some cases where, we, where you can still use prolonged albendazole, but on average, people used it for uh, a week, 21 days, up to a month, and it seems that a week is good enough. A week is good enough for most, for most cysts. The biggest debate that was in neurology was that if we treat these infections, if we kill this parasite, and we know that killing a parasite causes edema, won't that make the patient worse? Won't it make the seizure worse? And it seems like now, there's still a gray area, but the, you can err on the side of treating the patient. So we are, we are now treating the patient, and, um, and we think the epilepsy will get better. Then the, the second problem that we had was that when we, when we saw the cyst, we used to give you albendazole. It kills the cyst. So the scan looks fantastic. But then we didn't know what happened to the patient. And, that's, and that's, that's a problem which we often see, is that should we be treating scans, which makes us feel better, or should we be treating the patient in a scientific way to make sure that the, because you want to make, you want to make sure that the patient doesn't have seizures, and that's, that's, that, that's your goal in the end, not, not necessarily a clean screen. So it seems that now, on the, uh, on the whole, if you treat these patients, their seizures become less. Not remarkably, but they do become a bit less. So just to go through some of the treatments, and again, the, just the most important thing is just to understand uh, what, what kind of uh, involvement there is in the brain and then the treatment. So we said a single cyst, you're gonna, we tend to give albendazole 15 milligrams per, kilo, per kilogram. Uh, and what we do now is we're killing the, we're killing the parasite and at the same time, we're giving a dose of steroids. And the idea is that by giving the steroids, we're reducing the inflammation and the complication rate. Okay, so single, treat. Moderate infection, treat. If it's a, a heavy infection, you can still treat. Okay, and what's, but if it's a heavy infection and it's degenerating, that's almost the patient that you really want to, want to treat because you're thinking this, there's edema and I, 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 want to, I want to kill the parasite. But this is, this is a case where you, where you don't have to treat the patient. And then you, when you see the patient with calcifications, also uh, no anti-parasitic uh, treatment is indicated. What, then surgery comes, comes up much more in a longer time course as well. Okay, when the patient has um, lesions outside the brain, outside the brain matter itself. So you have a giant cyst, we give them albendazole now for about a month, uh, and then you have an option of su surgical excision. Um, if they have a, the subarachnoid, the grape-like cyst that I showed you, you're going to give it for more than a month with high dose of steroids. In some cases where people have uh, arachno uh, arachnoiditis and symptomatic, for example, they've got chronic headaches, some people give a longer course of steroids as well. Okay. So 
the, the treatment is, is, that's our best treatment for now. Uh, kill the parasite or offer some sort of surgical intervention. Why do this, what about the seizures, uh, which, is what, which is what the patient presents to in the first place? Okay, so the patient doesn't, the patient does get worried and fixated on the cyst itself, but, but the, they're going to follow you up, and, I, and in, in the end, we don't do follow-up seizures, uh, follow-up scans to determine if it's dead. What we're really following up with the patient is to make sure that they're not having any seizures or complication, complications later. So what we think is that seizures result from inflammation, uh, possibly intermittent antigen release or from scarring. And here's the tricky part, is that by killing, so by killing the, um, the cyst and, by, and leaving the patient with calcification, you still have an epileptogenic focus. So it doesn't necessarily follow that treatment leads to seizure re uh, a reduction in seizure. Uh, because what they think is that, is that the, the tissue, the cells around it uh, regrow, and when they re-sprout, that's the plasticity. They re-sprout in an abnormal way um, with, with abnormal um, uh, channels, channels on, the, on the lining of the cells, and that promotes epilepsy. Okay. Uh, so, so you have a patient with calcification, and that patient has, has an increased incidence of seizures. Then you have a patient who has, uh, in our patients who have, in our patients who have epilepsy, we find there's a concept called uh, mesial temporal sclerosis. It means they have changes in the brain, changes in the brain in the temporal lobe. And it seems that people with epilepsy, people with seizures from neurocystic psychosis, and this is the site of the neurocystic psychosis, they start having sclerosis at a different spot. And that's very weird. That's, that's, that, that doesn't make complete sense unless it means there's some sort of genetic abnormality relating to the uh, seizures or that seizure spread. It starts at one spot and then spreads to another spot and causes problems at another level. So uh, this, is, this is just relevant because we tend to do an operation. If you have mesial temporal sclerosis, we do epilepsy surgery and we try and reduce, and that reduces your, your medication usage and your risk of further seizures. Okay. The good news about epileptic treatment in patients who have neurocystic psychosis is they do quite well. They don't, they, they don't form a resistant group. We see, there, there's a group of, in epilepsy, we can, have, we can have patients on up to three drugs to try and control the epilepsy, but not in these patients. In these patients, one drug, they usually sort it out. We don't know the optimal duration of the anti-epileptic drug, on average, what we do as a, as a guideline is we, we normally say that if epilepsy is a disease that goes into remission as well. So we normally say if you have two years without any attacks, you're allowed to stop your medication. But in these patients, they go through the two years without seizures on medication, and once you stop the medication, they relapse. Up to 50% of them relapse. So it's, it seems to be more important to continue uh, anti-epileptic treatment in this group. The factors that are associated with seizure recurrence is if they have brain calcifications, if they have a high initial recurrent seizure, uh, seizure rate, and if they have multiple brain cysts before the institution of therapy. Steroids, so we told you we give steroids in an initial phase when, they, when the cyst is dying, when we are causing death of the cyst, or when the cyst is dying spontaneously, um, and then we normally give it for about a week, there are some cases where you're going to give more chronic courses, and that's more when it's affecting the meninges. You have a cystic psychotic encephalitis uh, uh, or a chronic meningitis. Uh, it also counteracts the effect of headache and vomiting that occurs when you're giving the cysticidal therapy. Uh, and then we can give it before, during, or after um, any surgery uh, to remove any of those cysts. Okay. So I think we would... It was already mentioned in the first lecture as to what, what things we can do to control it. Uh, some problems in control already discussed already. So future re research, what we're coming out now is we're trying to, we're trying to subclassify the different types of, uh, the, the, diff the management of the different uh, stages of the cystic psychosis. So whereas once upon a time the calcification was not taught, thought to have any edema, What's happening now is that what looks like calcification on a CT scan, if you do an MRI, you're now suddenly seeing 
that there's now there's edema associated with the with the calcification, which is which is an unusual thing, and just shows you that whatever we did think about, uh, whatever we thought was was a static stage, may be an ongoing and a progressive um, may have an ongoing and progressive component. So the future research is to treat depending on the stage. I think we we kind of got our handle on the patient with the larval stage. Larval stage, that's quite easy, the treatment, but we're not too sure about the degenerating larva. There haven't been studies on the, uh, and on the calcified patient as to whether we should maybe treat with more steroids uh, or treat with uh, cysticidal drugs. And then we don't have, although I've given you recommendations of how we treat these masses and the racemic cysts and the ventricular cysts, we don't have any studies. We don't have a group of 100 patients where we, where we, uh, where we try different methods. Okay. We're not too sure what the role of HIV is. Uh, HIV, uh, how is it going to affect the, the drug treatment and how is it going to affect the clinical presentation? And then just a small, one of our limitations up to a point is that we, we t it was easier to focus on treating the patient and then following them up in six months time to a year and looking at that scan and seeing that scan cleared up. If you looked at the epilepsy itself, there was many confounding factors. Like I said, did, was the patient drinking? Did the patient take his medication? Is that, is that why now the seizures are getting worse? Um, was the patient um, compliant or non-compliant or did they need a higher dose of drug or was, was there a wrong drug? So that's, that's why it makes it very difficult for us to determine uh, the effect of treatment. Uh, then we're not 100% sure on how long we should be giving the steroids. We give it for a week, but you could see that the inflammation could last two weeks for all, or, or a month, for all I know. But in general, the current recommendation is to uh, give it for a week and there's no long-term sequelae. So just, again, to come back to this diagnosis of cystisarcosis in the general population is 10 times more difficult than the diagnosis in the hospital patient. Um, and neither neuroimaging studies, serological assays, nor combination detects every single case of neurocystisarcosis. And you can get false positive and false uh, negative. And when I say f um, false, false positive, in the, uh, false negative, is that even when you are seropositive and you have seizures, it's, you'd expect that people who are seropositive would have a much higher incidence of of seizures, they don't have. So somewhere in between, there are other factors that are affecting the, uh, the degree of seizures. And then we talked about how you can be seronegative, but they have positive CT imaging, but no evidence of the disease. Uh, you can have asymptomatic infection, and then you can have false positive neuroimaging, where you see something that's not necessarily in neurocystisarcosis. TB granulomas can also calcify. Old trauma can also calcify. So many other things can can contaminate this or this uh, our studies. Okay, and that's that's the end.